So this is lecture seven of ECE 2305. So in this lecture, what we're going to be looking at is the start of a two lecture series where we're going to describe modulation and encoding techniques of analog and digital data. Right. So in lecture seven, or in this lecture, we're going to start with sort of a brief, des brief description of what is modulation, what is encoding. And then we're going to start with the first of uh, four types of modulation encoding, which involves taking digital data and using digital signals in order to convey that digital data. We'll then go through a laundry list of several popular types of encoding schemes. So what is modulation? So modulation is the process of encoding source data into a carrier signal that has a frequency FC. So that means we have, in this case, what we're going to be looking at in this lecture, we're going to have digital data, and somehow we're going to superimpose that data onto some digital signal. Okay? And so that carrier frequency, uh, FC, what that guy does is we choose him in order to be compatible with the transmission medium. So in this case, for digital data and digital signals, well, our transmission medium could be something like copper or uh, fiber optics or something of that nature. So we're pretty confident that we're not going to be um, sharing that medium with too many other um, uh, signals and such. So we can leave those at what we call baseband or around uh, zero hertz or DC. So we're not like talking about transmitting in gigahertz range like we do with Wi-Fi or, um, um, or uh, cell phones and, and that thing. So, um, and what about modulation? So modulation is the process or operation of taking data and manipulating that, like using that to manipulate that waveform based on one of several types of parameters such as waveform, uh, sorry, amplitude, frequency, or phase. We talked about this before when we described a little bit about Fourier analysis and how we can take a sine wave and represent data on that sine wave by manipulating its amplitude and or frequency and or phase. So we usually refer to the input source signal as something called M of T. And that could be that message signal. That's why we use M. The message signal, M of T, can either be analog or digital. And we usually refer to that as the baseband signal or modulating signal. Um, and then the carrier signal, F, C of T will be modulated onto a modulated signal, S of T. So S of T is sort of the output of the modulation process. So we have M of T, we do our magic, and we get S of T, and that's what's communicated across the, uh, uh, the transmission medium. All right, so, so what we're going to be looking at in lecture seven, this lecture, and lecture eight, are various ways of taking information, whether it's analog or digital, communicate it across a medium, and then receive it and transform it back into information. Okay. So here's that laundry, uh, no, not necessarily laundry list, but these are the types of formats where we can do modulation and encoding. We can have digital data and digital signals, and that's what we're going to look at in this lecture. And what this involves is we have like the encoding of digital data into a digital signal. It tends to be less complex and expensive than using a digital to analog and analog digital converter. So what a digital analog analog digital converter does is it transforms digital data, right? Could could be ones and zeros transformed into samples and such, and then we convert it into an analog signal that we propagate uh, across the medium and then we have to digitize it and bring it back into the digital domain. Um, but if we play with digital data and digital signals, what ends up happening is we don't need to do this conversion between the analog and digital domain. So that makes it very attractive because in a lot of equipment, one of the more expensive parts of a, of a transceiver will be the analog, digital, digital, analog converter, especially when you have to have one that operates at a really high sampling rate, right? Usually that's what drives up the cost of an A to D or D to A converter. There's also the analog data digital signal situation where we're trying to convert 
analog data, such as my voice, such as video, right, image information and such, into a digital format that can also be communicated across a modern digital transmission and switching scheme, and back into analog data at the receiver. Digital data analog signal, uh, this is more in tune with things like optical transmission and unguided media like wireless systems and propagates across an an uh, using analog signals. So what this guy does is essentially we take digital data, we convert it using a digital analog converter into an analog waveform. We usually then move its carrier frequency way up into the gigahertz, right? or tons of megahertz, in the case of optical communications, in the terahertz. Send it across the medium, and then at the receiver, bring it back down to baseband, to around DC, zero hertz. We then digitize it, analog to digital convert it, and then extract that digital information from it. Last but not least, there's analog data and analog signals, and what those guys are, that's like your FM radio, your AM radio, uh, your analog TV. What this is, is you have analog information and then you superimpose that on top of an analog carrier signal and communicate that over the air. So again, there's no digitization, there's no analog digital, digital analog converters or anything of that nature. It's straight analog signal, uh, sorry, analog data to an analog signal and then back to analog data. So let's focus on the digital signal. So these tend to be discrete, not discontiguous voltage pulses. So we, we talked a little bit about what the difference is between discrete and digital is. So discrete means that you have uh, at every, you have finite time samples where there is zero voltage, okay, in between those time samples. And then you have these voltage time samples happening every t seconds. Maybe it's uniform, maybe it's non-uniform. And that's what discrete is. Essentially, you have at these instances, you have a value, a value, a value, a value, and nothing in between. But discrete also means that we can have a continuum of amplitude values for every one of those samples. To be digital, to, for that signal to be digital, you have to have a finite number of amplitude values at every one of those samples because we need to convert this ultimately into ones and zeros, right? And if you have a continuum, you have an infinite number of amplitude values, there's no way you can represent it in a finite number of bits. So each one of those pulses, each one of those sampling instances is a signal element. It represents some information. And that binary data encoded into that signal element, that's what I was talking about. That amplitude value, per se, um, could mean, like, if I receive this amplitude value, it's this pattern of unique pattern of bits. And if it's that amplitude value, it must be that unique pattern of bits. The amplitude information of that sample contains the bit pattern that you wish to convey from transmitter over to receiver. The simplest case, of course, is you have two amplitude values, one representing a digital one and another amplitude value representing a digital zero. So the lingua franca in terms of like digital signaling and digital data and encoding and modulation, are there are several. The first is something called unipolar, okay? that all signal elements have the same sign. Okay? They're all positive or above zero. Okay? Polar means that we have one logical state represented by positive voltage and another one by a negative voltage. And I'll draw this in a, in a bit. You have data rate, which is the rate at which that data, that those ones and zeros that are encode, encoded in those sampling instances, right? those signal elements, how many bits represented in those signal elements are being conveyed, transmitted, and successfully received in unit time. You have the duration or the length of a bit, okay? which is how, how much time does it take to transmit one bit of information. 
in that, media, in that scheme. Modulation rate is the rate at which those signal levels change. So this is very relevant in situations where, suppose you have multiple bits, they're represented by a single amplitude, how quickly do those amplitude values change from one set of bit patterns to another set of bit patterns to another set of bit patterns? Finally, there's something called mark in space. And that refers to the binary digits ones and zeros. And you might wonder where the heck mark in space comes from. It comes from a technology from the 19th century where you have a little ticker tape machine. And what it does is that's a predecessor to our internet and such. So you have telegraphs and messages are sent across the telegraph lines and is received by a machine that just constantly spews out this little thin strip of paper and it punches a hole when it's a one and it doesn't punch a hole when it's a zero. Okay, so that's the space and a mark is that hole. Okay. So one thing you need to be mindful of are there are several practical considerations when we play with digital signals and digital data. Okay. At the receiver, there are several practical considerations. The receiver needs to know when it's receiving information. When does it start? When does it end? Because remember, like, it, usually the receiver, it's there. It's ready to catch information. But the information, unless you can create some way of saying to the receiver, here I am, I'm the start of the message. And oh, that's the last word, folks, and ends the message. It doesn't know unless you tell it. Or there is a protocol to define what the beginning and the end of the transmission is all about. There is also the signaling level. So remember, in some mediums, the amplitude information that's sent across might decrease. Right? The, the attenuation might make the received signal level much less than the transmit signal level when, when the information was first sent. So as a result, the receiver needs to know how much that signal is attenuated by in order to accurately decode amplitude information if that's what you're sending. Lastly, when you have tasks that are performed by sampling each element position and, and compared to a voltage threshold, you will need to know where you need to sample, right? Because the receiver, again, unless you explicitly tell it or you do some sort of tricky signal processing, it doesn't know where exactly to sample those specific, specific in instances of information, those elements that you're sending across the channel. Now, factors that affect the successful interpretation of these signals, because the receiver, what it's trying to do is, it's trying to guess what the transmitter is sending, right? So you're trying to give it every possible edge in order to be able to successfully determine what was sent. So the first one, signal noise ratio, and this should be a no-brainer. Because what happens is, suppose you have a lot of noise present in the transmission medium, it's going to hide, it's going to obfuscate, it's going to mess up the received signal. It's going to make it much harder for the receiver to determine what was sent. So we always want higher signal to noise ratio. And data rate and bandwidth, um, those are trade-offs too. We always want to send more and more information faster, right? Because Imagine you have a low data rate transmission. You can't watch YouTube with that, right? And so as a result, we like having higher data rates. The problem, though, the faster the data rates means more samples in the same unit amount of time. And this creates problems in terms of the receiver accurately determining what samples have been set and at what time, right? So, so you're really pushing the receiver in order to successfully guess samples that are ever increasingly getting closer to each other. So in, there are also a couple of principles that you need to be aware of. When you increase the data rate, you also increase the bit error rate. And that's what I just mentioned now. What, end up, what ends up happening is the more information you're cramming into the same amount of unit time, you're going to need more signaling elements. You're going to need more sampling instances. You're putting a lot of stress on the receiver and more error will begin creeping in, especially when you have lower signal-to-noise ratio. When you increase the signal-to-noise ratio, you decrease the bit error rate. So that means either you decrease the noise or increase the signal power. Either way, you increase the chance of the receiver successfully picking up the information, guessing the information right, and therefore the number of bits that are 
determined in error will decrease, right? Because you basically give the receiver a fighting chance to decode bits, guess bits more accurately. Third, when you increase the bandwidth, this also increases the data rate. Again, what happens is the more samples you send in unit time, uh, the more data you're getting across. And because of that higher frequency of information, remember, frequency, we have higher bandwidth. All right? So one factor that we did not talk about and, and we're going to look into is to improving performance is the type of encoding scheme that we're going to use. So there are a variety. There's something called non-return to zero. And there are a couple. There is non-return to zero, zero level, and then there's non-return to zero inverted. There's also something called multi-level binary, such as bipolar, AMI, and pseudo-ternary. There's something called uh, biphase, such as Manchester and differential Manchester, and then finally scrambling techniques, such as BHZS and HDB3. So let's look at non-return to zero level. Okay. So what is non non-return to zero level, what you've got is you've got two different voltages, zero and one bits, okay, that represent these two bits. And the voltage is constant during the bit interval, and there's no transition that happens during that interval. So what that means is that you do not return to the zero voltage level during that time. And so what ends up happening is you what you, you either have like a negative voltage for one value and a positive for another. So let's, let's draw that. Oops, sorry. What do I mean by that? Oh, let's do that. So non return to zero. What this means is, suppose I have one represented by this positive rectangular pulse from zero to t. And suppose I have zero represented by this, so let's say we call that a, and that's zero, and that's zero, zero t minus a, okay? That means if I were to transmit information in time, suppose I was sending across a medium 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. That means every t seconds, okay? So let's say that's 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, 5t, 6t, 7t, as an example. What we would get is A minus A, oh, sorry, minus A, minus A, A, minus A, A. Okay? So that is non-return to zero. Okay? So what ends up happening is we, we essentially transmit one of two possible amplitude values across every T seconds. All right? Uh, yep, yeah, there we go. All right. There's also something called non-return to zero inverted. So that's NRZI. And what non-return to zero inverted, what happens is it inverts on the ones. It's, so let's, like, let's actually, instead of describing it, so like what this means is that every time there's a one, and it's kind of cool, what happens is if there's a zero, the amplitude values, like the representations of what a 1 is and what a 0 is, um, is maintained. But what ends up happening is whenever a 1 is transmitted, your, 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 uh, 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 what happens is your mapping of your amplitudes actually invert. So it's pretty cool. So what happens is you have a constant voltage pulse for the duration of the bit, but the data is actually encoded based on the presence or the absence of a signal transition. So let's let's so what happens is you transition on low to high or high to low, and that denotes that a one has been transmitted. If nothing changes 
then uh, on every t seconds, that means a zero is transmitted. Okay? So let's look at that. And I'm going to try to do my best. It's a little bit wonky, but okay. So let's say we go back. And so suppose I have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay? What I'll get is let's say I start off with 0. So I have plus a amplitude. I have minus a amplitude. 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, 5t, 6t, 7t, 8t, 9t, 10t. Okay? So let's say I start off with minus a. Oh, still minus a. Still minus a. Aha! A 1 happens. I transition. Now I'm a. Oh, I'm a 0. There's no change. I preserve it until the next one. Oh, transition. Now I'm minus 1 again. Oh, 0 stay the same. 0 stay the same. Oh, a 1. I transition back to a 1. So what happens is only when there's a 1 do we change the amplitude value between one voltage level and the other. And otherwise, 0 just keeps everything constant, holds it, if you will, that amplitude value until the next one. All right. So differential coding, that was an example of differential coding, where the information that's transmitted is not absolute. The amplitude value does not say, this is absolutely 1 and this is absolutely 0. But rather, the transitions, the way the information depends be from the previous and the successive in, uh, bits of information, the pulses, if you will, that actually contains the information. It's like relative information versus absolute information in terms of amplitude or whatever sort of uh, modulation scheme that you're using. So in other words, the data is represented in terms of the changes between successive signal elements rather than the elements themselves. And in this way, it's actually more re reliable to detect the transitions because what happens is maybe you corrupt one bit or another bit, but you also have the backup of the previous and the successive signal elements in order to sort of fill in possible errors. Okay? So that's actually quite a nice feature if you especially are operating an error-prone channel. So the advantages of NRZ is that it's easy to engineer and make efficient use of bandwidth, but it doesn't have a DC component, right? And it doesn't have uh, synchronization capability. So as a result, uh, codes are usually used, these codes are usually used for things like digital magnetic recording, but not really for signal transmission. So, so for instance, if you have uh, tape drives and such, or, uh, or any other form of like a, a magnetic recording, you would be using something like this, okay? Because of, unfortunately, the disadvantages associated with it. Now, binary multi-level uh, multi um, uses more than just two levels, okay? So, um, it has like alternate mark inversion. So the zero represent, is represented by no line signal. And a one is represented by a positive or a negative pulse, right? So one, one, pu one pulse must alternate in polarity, okay? So one pulse is alternating in polarity. So let's say one, you get a positive value. Let's say zero, you have no signal. And then the next one is a negative, okay? So in this case, you don't have a loss in synchronization if the long string of ones occurs. Uh, zeros actually could be a problem because it's like, what was that last one, right? And, or nothing happens. Like, is someone still transmitting? How do you differentiate no transmission versus zero transmission? And there's no net DC component, and it provides a simple way of error detection. So what do I mean by this? So let's, let's actually draw this. So again, so let's do Okay. Let's make some problems. So what I would get is something like this. That would be a 1, no signal level for a 0, and then I would alternate, say, aha. That's also 1, but it has now it has to take turns. It has to be a negative value. 0 line voltage, 1, 0 one, one, 
1, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way. This is actually the problem. How do you know that there's no transmission whatsoever as opposed to a transmission of zeros? This is a problem with this scheme. Pseudo ternary, uh, on the other hand, what happens is the 1 is represented by the absence of a line signal, and 0 now represents either by a positive or a negative pulses. And there's really no advantage or disadvantage over the bi bi uh, bipolar uh, AMI. Ah, this is one of my favorites. So Manchester, it sounds so noble, right? So regal. So Manchester uh, coding. Um, is, is kind of tricky because what happens is you have a transition at the middle of each bit period and then the mid-bit transition serves as a clocking mechanism okay, for the data. So uh, low to high represents a 1 and high to low represents a 0. So this is actually pretty cool stuff. So let's, let's look at that. Uh, let me just double check. What is it? Low to high, 1. High to low, 0. Okay. And these things get kind of confusing after Okay, so if I do 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, what do I have? So what you get is uh, so something like this. So, wow, let, let me just double check. Ah, yes, okay. So low to high, and then high to low, low to high, high to low, low to high, low to high, high to low, high to low. So what we've got is notice that we have that cool feature that allows us now to sort of determine, we can use that as a clocking mechanism so we don't have to worry about is it transmitting or is it not transmitting. Like, like in the case of the um, bipolar AMI, right? Or the pseudo ternary. So, and we can take this one step further. We can, so this is just Manchester, but differential Manchester, just like the other differential technique, so differential diff Manchester is a little bit different. So differential Manchester will alternate, okay, based on whether you have ones and zeros, or uh, like whether a one is there or if a zero is there. So let me keep that. So let's, let's just go back to the description. So differential Manchester, again, the mid, the mid bit transitions used for clocking, which is very powerful. And then the zero um, is represented by a transition at the beginning of a bit period. And the one is represented by the absence of a transition at the, at the beginning of a bit period. So it's a differential encoding scheme. It just as before. So the zero, what ends up happening is you, it, if you have a transition um, at the beginning of a bit period, uh, then you know, okay, so uh, you know that there, there's, there's something going on, that, uh, that, that you do have a zero. So, hmm, yeah, this is going to be confusing to, to, um, to elaborate. So huh, let's, let's try and do it, okay? Let's do this together. So let's say we take again one. So that means there should be no, um, um, no, no, um, uh, blah 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 blah, no transition at the beginning of the bit period. But it's already at the beginning. So let's say we have that. Ah, zero means that we do have to have a transition at the beginning. So transition. It's a one. Okay, so one we don't have a transition. Oh, it's a zero. We have to have a transition. Oh, it's a one. We don't need to have a transition. A and the transition has to be the beginning, right? Oh, it's a one. Still no transition. Oh, it's a zero. We have to trans transition. Oh, it's a zero. We have to transition. So notice that the transition must uh, occurs at the, um, or lack of transition occurs at the boundary uh, or the beginning of every new period. Okay? I know, confusing, eh? Okay. So the advantages are, again, the self-clocking, 
So we have a predictable transition guaranteed mid-bit, okay, or uh, in, in midway through the pulse, right? There's no DC component. Um, the error detection is great because there's an absence of an expected transition that can be used to detect errors, but you require at least one transition every time. And that the maximum modulation rate is twice of that of um, NRZ and requires more bandwidth because of all those transitions. Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes lecture seven of ECE 2305.